Time perhaps to change the way you feel about Vauxhall's Corsa. This fifth generation version has been a huge sales success for the brand, frequently the UK's best selling car, but it needed a bit more showroom appeal. Hence the importance of this midterm update, which brings the front end look into line with the brand's other models and introduces some new electrified drivetrain tech for both the combustion and EV variants. The F generation of Vauxhall's Corsa, introduced in 2019, has proved to be a bit of a surprise hit for the Stellantis Group in the UK, frequently the nation's bestseller. To keep that sales momentum going, the brand substantially updated the car in autumn 2023, creating the model we're going to look at here. The nameplate here dates back to the Corsa A model of 1982, badged as a Vauxhall Nova in the UK. Our market first met the Corsa in 1993. That B model replaced by this Corsa C contender in 2000, before a complete redesign for the Corsa D of 2006. That car was only lightly reskinned to create this current car's predecessor, the Corsa E of 2014 a fourth generation model that had to carry on well past its sell-by date before it was replaced in autumn 2019 by the Mark V Corsa F model we have here. This current car's sales success is partly down to the gradual phasing out of this car's traditional arch rival, Ford's Fiesta. But even so, it must be gratifying for Vauxhall's parent conglomerate because the costs of developing this particular P2JO design weren't too huge. Pretty much all the engineering shared with the current Peugeot 208, as well as with the DS3. Both those French models sharing this Vauxhall CMP platform which wasn't the original plan at all. This Corsa F initially developed with a shortened version of the GM developed chassis used by the larger Mark 7 Astra family hatch. But then in 2017, Vauxhall and Opel were sold for 1.2 billion pounds to what was then called the PSA Group, now part of the Stellantis conglomerate. And everything changed with this badge engineered model rushed to market from scratch rather impressively, in under two years. Since then, it's sold in large enough numbers to cause a bit of Stellantis head-scratching, because three-quarters of all the units sold have been of the combustion kind, rather than of the coarser electric model that Vauxhall must prioritise going forward if it's to achieve an EV-orientated sales mix that avoids potential European market tax penalties. But that's a problem for another day. Right here, right now, Vauxhall's happy for you to choose any kind of Corsa. And there's a wider choice these days with a frugal full hybrid version having joined the lineup, plus an extra long range version of the Corsa Electric. All these variants get the smarter look you see here, along with a cabin screen media update. But in the face of tough competition, will it all be enough? to keep this Vauxhall sales momentum strong? Well, you'll need the industry's most comprehensive review, a car and driving road test to find out. Many of us learn to drive in a Corsa or spent our formative early years at the wheel of an old one like this. This is the Corsa C model of 2000, the second generation of Corsa badge models sold in the UK. And not since then has this Vauxhall ever been as light as it is now, which sounds promising in terms of agility and frugality. So what will this modern era version be like? As you'd expect, it's certainly a degree or so more sophisticated these days. So will it also be that way to drive in this F era model's revised form? Well, let's see. Nothing's changed with the drive dynamics as part of this Mark V model's update, but quite a lot's different in terms of powertrains, though none of that affects the unelectrified mainstream combustion models that the vast majority of customers still choose. It's one of those we're trying here. Actually, the one that most customers want, the 100 PS turbocharged version of the little 1.2 litre three-cylinder petrol engine that all fossil-fueled courses continue to use. 
You could also have this unit in 75 PS, normally aspirated form. Or as part of this facelift models update, as a more frugal hybrid with a clever EDCT6 dual clutch gearbox. Then there's the full battery Corsa electric model, which now comes with a choice of battery packs. We'll get to all of that in a moment, after we've told you a bit about this Vauxhall's road-going experience, especially in the combustion guise, which is our focus here. In its mainstream forms, the Corsa's never been known as a particularly fun-to-drive Super Mini, but it's a car that's always worked well on UK roads. Prior to 2017, when US giant General Motors owned the brand, that was because Vauxhall was usually granted the autonomy from its Opel parent to specifically tune this model line for the terrible tarmac we have here in Blighty. When the PSA Group took over the mark, an organisation later consumed by the Stellantis conglomerate, there was little interest in anything but rushing this Corsa F model to market as a badge engineered version of the second generation Peugeot 208. But at least inheriting that French rival CMP platform delivered the promisingly light weight we referred to earlier. To quote again from our favourite mantra from Lotus founder Colin Chapman, give a car more power and it'll go faster on the straights. Take weight out of it and it'll go faster everywhere. And sure enough, this Corsa does go faster everywhere than its pre-2019 era predecessor, especially through the turns. Though you might not want it to because the steering initially has a slightly disconcerting lightness that rather masks the road-holding prowess this car undoubtedly has. Exactly the sort of thing that in the past the Vauxhall engineers would have dialed out for the twistier roads of the UK market. Of course, typical urban orientated Corsa buyers who love the way the rack mounted electric steering motor makes the wheel so easy to twirl around when they're navigating the streets won't care much about this trait. But if you do, you'll find that things are a little better in this regard if you can progress from a base design spec version into the more purposeful mid range GS level of trim that we're trying here. That's because with this spec, you get a sport button, which as well as introducing a slightly rortier note to the exhaust, also adds a bit of extra steering weight at speed, at which point you notice that the helm is actually very accurate with a progressive force buildup that makes this Vauxhall easy to place on the road. Plus, from the GS grade upwards, the car's suspension is equipped with special strut tower tie rods which provide a form of cross bracing to create a more solid and precise feel through the steering. In the past, rally teams used to try and deliver the same thing by installing full cross braces across the engine bay. This is a simpler way of achieving the same end. Anyway, the result is a bit of extra cornering bite, which at speed through the bends gives the car an admirable tendency to go exactly where you point it. We'll come back to drive dynamics after we've said a little more about the various powertrain choices we touched on earlier. As we said, there's a base 75 PS version of the 1.2 litre engine available, petrol powered of course. Diesel engines were discontinued in the model in 2022. In this form, the little power plant is normally aspirated and makes 60 miles an hour from rest in 13.2 seconds en route to 108 miles an hour. But with just 118 newton meters of torque, it's somewhat lacking in pulling power, so typical give and take urban driving will require frequent use of the five speed manual gearbox that choosing this baseline unit necessitates you to have. So it's altogether better to bargain your way up into the turbocharged 100 PS version of this engine the vast majority of Corsa buyers choose. As we said, that's what we're trying here. It's still a great little lump, which as you'd expect, courtesy of the turbo, delivers much more of a shove from low revs with nearly double the amount of pulling power. There's also a lovely warble as it goes about its business, which is notably less restrained here than it is in a comparable Peugeot 208. Perhaps another example of the engineer's motivation to make this car feel fractionally sportier than its French cousin. In comparison to the base variant, the 60 mile an hour sprint time is reduced to 9.9 seconds and the maximum speed rises to 120 miles an hour. 
Should you want the option of automatic transmission with the unelectrified version of this engine, you have to have this unit in 130 PS form, though that's not enough to stop the performance stats from falling fractionally to 10.8 seconds and 119 miles an hour. It's actually a really rather sophisticated auto with no fewer than eight speeds, steering wheel paddles, and a drive mode system with eco, normal, sport, and manual modes. Choose your Corsa with the hybrid version of this engine that we mentioned earlier, and as usual with a full hybrid, you have to have an auto gearbox, though this is a rather different kind of self-shifting transmission, and not only because it's of the dual clutch sort and restricted to six speeds. Built into its casing is a DC inverter, an engine control unit, and most significantly, a little 28 horsepower electric motor powered by a tiny battery secreted beneath the front passenger seat. On the move, this motor can work together with the hybrid model's 1.2 litre petrol engine, or separately from it. And unlike with a mild hybrid system like that fitted to say a Fiesta, here the car can be driven for short urban distances under 18 miles an hour on electric power alone. During deceleration, the petrol engine stops and the e-motor acts as a generator to recharge the hybrid system's 48 volt battery. The battery also stores the energy recuperated by the regenerative braking system. And the motor also assists the engine under acceleration, such as from standstill to 62 miles an hour, which takes 10.7 seconds for the 100 PS model, or 8.6 for the alternative 136 PS version. Mind you, those figures are only 0.1 second faster than the equivalent unelectrified derivative that we're trying here. There is another Corsa power plant to talk about, but it's not of the combustion engine variety. Almost right from the beginning of this Corsa F model's production, Vauxhall's offered a full battery version of it. As with the rival Peugeot E208, this is based around a 50 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery, mated to a 100 kilowatt electric motor, putting out 136 PS, and working through the usual single speed auto transmission you get with EVs. With this revised model, Vauxhall still offers that package with a 62 mile an hour sprint time of 8.9 seconds en route to 93 miles an hour and drive range massaged up to 221 miles. Some customers of small hatches these days though are expected to go a bit further than that between charges, so Vauxhall also now offers a long range version with a denser, more sophisticated 51 kilowatt hour battery that'll take you up to 248 miles. This variant has a slightly meatier 156 PS motor, so improves the 62 mile an hour sprint time to 8.2 seconds. If you want to know more about the Corsa Electric, we've done a separate film on it. Our focus today though is on combustion powered Corsa models, and if your interest lies with those variants too, then a key consideration with this little urban runabout will be its standard of ride quality. Well, it can't match the kind of thing you get in a rival Volkswagen Polo. Few super minis can do that. And the fairly basic torsion beam rear suspension that all small cars feature means you'll certainly feel speed humps and crumbly potholes. Overall though, what's served up in this Corsa is a firm but supple standard of damping that works as well on the open road as it does around town. In development, Chief Engineer Thomas Venk and his team worked particularly hard on wheel control, which was improved to an extent that allowed them to dial back the intervention of the chassis stability electronics. You might even notice that if you're an enthusiastic driver. Pushing on through damper conditions, you won't find the ESC cutting in all the time, as it does in such a scenario in most rival models. Of course, most of the time when driving this car, you'll want the benefit of driver assistance features. And there are a few if you're able to stretch up to the ritziest variants. Notably, adaptive cruise control with a lane positioning assistant that takes over some highway driving duties from you. It's a useful system that would give this car a much needed unique selling point if it were to be fitted across the range. And this Vauxhall needs USPs of that kind for it to stand out in its crowded segment, set itself apart from its Stellantis Group Peugeot and Citroen stablemates, and somehow stem the current trend that's drawing customers out of super minis and into the trendier small crossover models developed from them. 
this is the most complete, most sophisticated Corsa there's ever been. It's just that we think it could have been even better. Some mid-term model updates often seem a bit half-hearted, but this one genuinely meets the brief, which was to give this fifth generation Corsa a bit of extra, much needed visual character. The rather apologetic looks of the original version didn't seem to put many customers off, but you can't help thinking that this Vauxhall might have done better still if it had looked like this back in 2019. As before, there are short overhangs, quite an upright screen, and this five door only body shape. That's its dimensions almost exactly replicate those of a second generation Peugeot 208. It's hardly a surprise given the CMP platform that both cars share and the extent to which Vauxhall had to draw from the engineering of its French Stellantis Group partner during this Corsa F design's rather rushed period of development between 2017 and 2019. The resemblance is particularly noticeable here at the side which as before is characterized by a swept back roof line, a pronounced mid-level crease above the door handles, and in usual Vauxhall fashion, a lower swage line flowing upwards towards the rear wheel arch in a blade-like formation. Avoid entry-level trim and you get this contrast-colored black roof and a wheel upgrade from 16-inch alloys to the 17-inch rims that feature here. You'll have noticed that the major changes with this update are here at the front, where the car now fits visually in with the rest of the latest Vauxhall range, thanks to the adoption of the brand's distinctive visor-style front grille. A single solid black panel with a restyled Griffin badge, which will be darkly trimmed like this, unless you choose base trim. That panel's flanked by slightly more squared off slimline headlights, which are now of the LED sort across the range, and on top variants can feature the brand's Intellilux matrix pixel tech that continuously adapts the beam to road conditions and the surrounding traffic. Slimmer corner cutouts and black lower intake trimming complete the changes. The rear isn't much different, though if you own the early version of this Mark V model, you might notice the fact that instead of a Corsa badge, the model name is now spelled out in space out lettering across the tailgate, as is the current trend. There are minor changes to the tail lamps as well, which will be LED illuminated, provided you avoid entry level trim. These lower corner cutouts add a bit of visual interest and this smart roof spoiler offers a neat finishing touch. This will be black to match the roof if you've avoided entry level trim. That contrast colored top combining well with the livelier palette of colors now available. We've got two coat metallic crimson red here, which like almost every other shade on offer will cost you extra. Of course, as usual, what's more important is what you can't see, in this case, impressively lightweight. Previous to this fifth generation design, Corsa's tended to be a bit on the portlier side in super mini terms, but this Corsa F design switch to its Gallic CMP platform reversed that trend in fine style, meaning an impressive 108 kilogram weight reduction over the old pre-2019 era Corsa E. That leaves an entry level version tipping the scales at just 980 kilograms. Some city cars from the class below weigh more than that. So, subtle but effective changes outside. Will the same be true in the cabin? Pretty much, yes. The key difference is this new 10-inch centre touchscreen, but there are other differences too, like a redesigned steering wheel, smarter upholstery options, and these revised sports seats. If your experience of Corsa models is of the pre-2019 era E-Series Mark IV model, you won't find this cabin to be as spacious as you might remember, but you'll also find it rather better trimmed, though other rivals set higher standards here. Not everyone will like the deck chair-like stripes on seats that sit you much lower than with previous generation Corsas, and it's certainly true that there isn't quite as plush an ambience as you get in this car's Peugeot 208 cousin. But that car has to have a curious eye cockpit dash design that forces you to view the instruments over the top of the steering wheel rim, something not everyone likes. If you happen to have tried a Peugeot 208 as part of your round of super mini test drives, 
You might not find it hard to spot the shared interior fittings, the infotainment system, the window switches, the auto gear shifter, even the key. But equally, we're pleasantly surprised by just how much autonomy the Opal Vauxhall designers were given here in creating their own kind of cabin. There's far more differentiation here than you get, say, between the cabin architecture designs of different Volkswagen, Seat and Skoda Volkswagen Group products. Not all of this is welcome. The oversized Vauxhall gear knob we could do without, and the pedal box is tighter than we'd ideally like. But generally, it's all ergonomically very sound. Design chief Mark Adams and his team having used what they call functional partitioning to split up certain areas. The seats are supportive, nothing's irritatingly awkward to get to, and everything's exactly where you expect it to be. Even the climate functions are properly separated out into controls at the bottom of the centre stack, unlike in a 208. Adams and his team, having thankfully rejected the opportunity that Peugeot's fascia design offered of building these into the central screen. Ah oh yes, screens. As we mentioned, there's been a bit of an upgrade with this centre one, which gets over-the-air software updates and is now of 10 inches in size, even with the humblest trim levels. It's actually a completely redesigned Qualcomm Snapdragon monitor, but as tends to be the case with Stellantis model displays, quite a lot of the screen real estate is taken up by flanking touch-sensitive buttons and ventilation options, so your actual viewing window doesn't actually seem as big as the screen size promises. It's a pity you don't get the physical menu shortcut buttons with this display that feature on the larger Astra hatch, the pre-facelift Corsa model's older screen had more of these too, but otherwise this monitor's well laid out and responsive. It doesn't get navigation, a connected 3D setup, unless you stretch to top spec trim, but the standard Apple CarPlay and Android Auto phone mirroring functionality is so good, now of the wireless kind, that you don't really need it. Just connect up to an app like Waze instead. There's potentially more screen functionality in the instrument binnacle you view through the smart, grippy, three-spoke, faux leather-stitched flat-bottom steering wheel we mentioned earlier. If you can avoid entry-level trim, which has a 3.5-inch digital instrument cluster, you get this set of digital dials on a 7-inch virtual screen. This shows a digital speedometer flanked by vertical displays for revs and fuel level. As for practicalities, well, our testers had mixed feelings here. As with so many French-derived cars, the glove box is halved in size by an awkwardly shaped fuse box. You get the usual connectivity ports in a deep well in front of the gear stick, a 12 volt and a USB socket, plus space for a wireless charging mat, but it can't all be shut away with a cover. So you'll need to leave your smartphone powering up in front of prying eyes. An overhead sunglasses compartment has been omitted and there's no provision for anything like under seat or passenger footwell storage. But on the plus side, the door pockets are of a reasonable size and incorporate angled bottle holders. Plus you get ticket clips in the sun visors, while twin cup holders and a storage tray sit by the conventional handbrake. There are coin slots next to the gear stick. You get this open cubby by the driver's right knee. There's another small cubby in the door pull. And on plusher models, this center armrest with its tiny lidded storage area is either standard or optional. What else? Well, taller drivers might find the pedals placed a little too close for comfort, but there's plenty of seat height and steering column adjustability. Build quality from a Spanish factory is okay, but perhaps it's slightly intentional that fit and finish here doesn't feel quite as assured as it does in a Peugeot 208, given that competing Gallic models fractionally higher price points. That's a dangerous game for Stellantis to play, given the way that the rivals are improving so much in this regard. This cabin certainly can't quite replicate the sheer solidity of a Volkswagen Group product in this segment. Still, there are nice touches. The shiny mid-level fascia covering looks smart. The way that little speakers have been built into the A-pillars is clever. And the double stitching on the front door cards looks classy. But the dashboard's glossy black plastic doesn't feel as nice as it looks and, of course, will mark easily. Plus, as usual with a car of this kind, quite a few hard plastic mouldings feature around the cabin. 
which is fine at the bottom of the range, but less pleasant if, as is quite likely, you happen to be paying well over £25,000 for your Corsa. Aided by the relative narrowness of these front A pillars, all round visibility is better than is the case with some rivals, which is just as well because rear parking sensors don't come as standard with base design trim and you can't add them in at the bottom of the range. Avoid that base spec level though, and as well as all round sensors, you'll get a now improved high resolution wide view rear camera. Okay, time to look at the rear seat, which is where things start to unravel a little bit. There are clear advantages to creating a shared platform that can take combustion engine, hybrid and full electric drivetrains, and not only in terms of manufacturing simplicity. For instance, the impetus to create the Featherlight weight figure we referenced earlier was primarily driven by the fact that the designers knew if they didn't, then the battery powered version was going to end up hopelessly overweight. But there are disadvantages too in the full electric version of this car. You might not mind too much about the prospect of rear bench room being somewhat constrictive if you took into account the need to place the powertrain's battery pack beneath that back seat. Having to accept the same restrictions in a combustion powered Corsa just because it happens to have an electrified relative is less easy to accept. The first sign of this comes when you inspect the narrow rear door opening through which you have to pass to access the back of the car. An aperture constricted not only by packaging issues and a rather bulky bit of bodywork over the rear wheels, but also by the substantial reduction in the roof height of this fifth generation model. If you're particularly tall or you habitually need to reach into the back to fasten things like child seats, you're not going to like it at all. Once inside, it's actually not too bad. There's certainly less room than there was in the previous pre-2019 era E-generation Corsa, despite the fact that this Mark V model has 28 millimeters of extra wheelbase length. But there's not much less space than you get in the back of a Renault Clio, for instance, though that's not really saying much. To be frank, both models are somewhat embarrassed in this regard by some supposedly smaller and much cheaper city cars from the class below, like. Hyundai's i10. There's not much room for either knees or heads. Larger adults certainly wouldn't want to be spending too long here. But does that matter given that for the majority of buyers these rear seats will be used only occasionally for those above school age? Only you can decide. It helps that the designers have done the best with what they had to work with. The curvature of the front seat backs is designed to improve knee room. There's a notably low centre transmission tunnel and there's lots of room to poke your feet beneath these front seats. There's hardly anywhere to store things though. The door bins are tiny and Vauxhall doesn't offer seat back pockets, which seems a bit mean, but you get these overhead lights. There hasn't been any attempt to break up the unremittingly drab plastic of the door card. And you'd also think that modern car designers would realize the importance of offering at least the option of rear connectivity ports. They can't be included here, though you'll also find the same issue with rival models. Finally, let's take a look at the boot, which is 309 litres in size, which is a capacity figure that remains slightly below class standards. The Polo, for instance, has 46 litres more, the Skoda Fabia 71 litres more, and a Clio 82 litres more. Vauxhall though feels pretty proud that there's no compromise in cargo area size if you go for the battery powered Corsa electric variants, which must have taken quite a lot of development effort. There's quite a high loading lip, which you notice because there's no adjustable height boot floor to mitigate it, not even as an option. These rubber bung attachments on the inside of the tailgate seem a bit flimsy and might quickly go missing. And you only get a couple of floor tie down points and a single bag hook on the right. It's quite a usable squarely sized space though with 885 millimeters of length and 867 millimeters of width. As usual in this class, there's no seat folding cleverness, stuff like adjustable seat backs for awkwardly shaped loads, a ski hatch or a 40-20-40 rear bench split. You'd think super mini designers might be building that kind of stuff in by now. So instead, there's just a straightforward 60-40 rear bench split, which once retracted, 
reveals 1,118 litres of capacity when you load to the roof. If you'd got used to coarser pricing for base models being in the 16 to 25,000 pound bracket, which is where it was when we last tested this Mark V F series model back in 2020, you might need a cup of hot sweet tea or indeed something stronger after perusal of the figures being asked for this updated version, which at the time of this test in early 2024 was starting from just under £20,000 for the feeblest 1.2 litre 75 PS normally aspirated base spec petrol variant. You're probably going to want to find the extra £900 Vauxhall wants for the perkier 100 PS turbo version of this engine. That's what we're trying here. With a 100 PS Corsa, you'll be offered the option of auto transmission for an extra £1,730 more. All the figures we've so far quoted are for base design spec. Mid-range GS trim, which is what we have today, comes next. Then there's top ultimate trim, which with a combustion engine now costs from just under £26,000. Of course, Vauxhall's hoping you have more to spend on this Super Mini. The EDCT6 hybrid versions, which are auto only, start from around £23,000 in 100 PS form and sell across the same three trim levels. With mid-range GS spec, you'll be offered the chance to find just under a thousand pound more for the quicker 136 PS version of that hybrid engine, which is all you can have if you opt for the hybrid variant with top ultimate trim. By that time though, you'll be shelling out around 29,000 pounds for your Corsa, which is well on the way to the sum you'll need for the full EV version. But not quite enough. At the time of this test, the full EV Corsa Electric was selling in the 32,500 to 36,000 pound bracket. And it's also offered across the design, GS and ultimate trim levels. With a Corsa Electric in design trim, you can only have the old 136 PS powertrain. With mid-range GS trim, there's the option of finding around 1,500 pounds more for the latest 156 PS long range powertrain. And with top ultimate spec, you can only have that long range powertrain. Got all that? Good. Across the entire Corsa range, five doors are mandatory, of course. So, how do these figures stack up in comparison to obvious Super Mini rivals? Well, unfortunately, they're actually pretty typical. If we use the 100 PS 1.2 litre model, the version you'll probably be looking at as a guide, then the starting figure of just over £20,000 applicable at the time of this test is about what you'd also need for comparable turbo versions of the Skoda Fabia, the Mazda 2 and the Ford Fiesta EcoBoost, which was just still on sale at the time of this test. As we filmed, you'd have needed around £1,000 to £1,500 more for equivalent versions of the Peugeot 208, the Hyundai i20 and the Volkswagen Polo. Of course, there are cheaper Super Minis out there. As we filmed this 100 PS model, an equivalent Seat Ibiza was around £800 less, and a Renault Clio TCE90 was around £1,800 less. And you could save even more by opting for more budget-orientated models like the Citroen C3 or the Suzuki Swift. The real budget brand contenders in this segment, the Dacia Sendero and the MG3, are priced at around £14,000, but they'll cost significantly more to run. A few words on electrified courses. If you're looking at the hybrid version, you'll have a slightly different set of rivals in view. The base hybrid model starting figure we mentioned was, at the time of this review, around £1,700 more than a Renault Clio E-Tech full hybrid, but £400 less than a Toyota Yaris and nearly £3,500 less than a Honda Jazz. Finally, there's the Corsa Electric, which isn't our focus here, of course. We've covered it in a separate review. Enjoy that. But for reference, it's priced at the same level as its identically engineered Peugeot E208, Stellantis Group stablemate. If having considered all of that and you've got your Vauxhall salesperson to sharpen their pencil a bit, you decide that it really is a Corsa that you want, then you're going to need to know about standard specs. So let's take a look at that now, basing our comments on what you get with a combustion model like the one we have here. 
Even entry-level design variants come pretty well equipped with LED headlights featuring high beam assist, 16-inch grey alloy wheels, also headlamps and wipers, and a reasonable tally of camera safety kit, which we'll get to in a moment. Inside, in a design spec variant, there's air conditioning, a flat-bottomed leather effect stitched steering wheel, a three and a half inch digital color instrument screen and cruise control with an intelligent speed limiter that adjusts itself to prevailing limits so you should never be zapped by a speed camera. Infotainment's taken care of by a 10 inch color touchscreen featuring Apple CarPlay or Android Auto smartphone mirroring, Bluetooth and a decent quality six speaker DAB audio system. Here, as mentioned earlier, we've gone for the sportier GS trim level that many buyers will want. These variants recognizable by the black contrast coloring used for the roof and A pillars. Plus a range of extra touches, dark tinted rear windows, a rear roof spoiler, high gloss black B pillars, chrome effect exhaust tailpike extensions, a black grill Griffin logo and LED tail lamps. Plus there are larger 17 inch wheels and all round parking sensors are added at this level too, along with a sport switch, which firms up the steering and adds a slightly rortier exhaust note. Inside in a GS spec model, you'll find the cabin marked out by the addition of alloy effect pedals and a black headliner. Plus there's a seven inch color instrument screen. You get electronic climate control and the center screen also gains a wireless connection for the phone mirroring systems. It's worth pointing out that providing you avoid a base spec design model, your Corsa will come with the Vauxhall Connect package that gives you quite a lot. First and foremost, there's an e-call system that at the press of a button, 24-7, 365 days a year, will put you in touch with a trained advisor in the event of an emergency or breakdown, and it'll automatically alert the emergency services should the airbags go off in a collision. Using a downloadable My Vauxhall app, Vauxhall Connect will also give you access to live navigation services, so you can plan a route in advance on your computer, then forward it to your car, saving a lot of faffing around when you get in at the start of your journey. There's also regular vehicle diagnostic info, plus the app will allow you to lock or unlock your car via your phone from wherever you are in the world. It can even let you or someone you nominate access and start the car using a smartphone. Vauxhall Connect additionally includes a range of specific services for Corsa electric owners, including trip planning, remote settings and public charging solutions. OK, so that's covered off mainstream trim. Let's go further up the range. Now, if you're wanting to spoil yourself a little in your choice of Corsa, your dealer will point you towards the plush Ultimate models. These also get the contrast coloured black roof, but are distinguishable to the eagle-eyed from GS variants by different badging and sill plates, and more significantly, by the brand's Intellilux LED matrix headlights that constantly adapt themselves to road conditions and surrounding traffic. At that top level in the range, as you'd expect, you get navigation plus a panoramic rear view camera, keyless entry, heat for the front seats and steering wheel, part Alcantara upholstery, a centre front armrest that includes storage, a wireless phone charger, plus a driver's seat with massaging and lumbar support, plus some extra camera safety features we'll cover off for you in a moment. On to options. There are actually not many. With this mid-range GS spec, you can pay £500 more for a winter pack that gives you the heat for the front seats and steering wheel and the front centre armrest storage area. With ultimate trim, you can add a fixed panoramic glass sunroof and on all models, you can pay extra so that your dealer will be able to fit a spare wheel. But what about paint? Well, if you don't like the black roof of the two upper trim levels, there's the no cost option of having the top of your car in body color. That body color is likely to cost you extra though, as the only standard shade is solid Arctic white. We've got one of the optional two coat premium metallic shades here. It's crimson red. Let's finish with a look at safety. Now, you'd expect a modern super mini these days to come with some sort of autonomous braking system fitted as standard across the range, and this Corsa doesn't disappoint. The automatic emergency city braking active safety brake system is standard fit, working in conjunction 
with a also standard forward collision alert setup. It works at speeds between 3 and 53 miles an hour as you drive, scanning the road ahead in search of potential collision hazards. If once detected, you'll be warned if you don't respond or aren't able to, then at speeds of below 19 miles an hour, your Corsa will autonomously brake itself to a complete stop with 0.9 G of braking, avoiding the obstacle. At speeds of between 19 and 53 miles an hour, speed will be reduced by up to 14 miles an hour. The system can specifically identify vehicles, pedestrians, bicycles, and motorbikes. Other standard safety features include lane departure warning with lane keep assist, which alerts you if you drift out of your lane and applies subtle corrective lock to steer you back to where you ought to be. Like automatic emergency city braking, we found that this feature works smoothly and unobtrusively with a refreshing lack of too many jerks, beeps and bongs. What else is standard in terms of safety camera kit? Well, there's a driver's attention warning, driver drowsiness system, which monitors your driving reactions for drowsiness, which if detected will prompt a warning to stop for a restorative coffee. And it'll automatically warn you to take a break if you've been driving for more than a couple of hours at speeds of above 40 miles an hour. There's also speed sign recognition, which pictures speed signs as you pass, then displaying them on the dash, which is what drives the intelligent speed limiter we just mentioned. Also, as mentioned earlier, there's that e-call system as part of Vauxhall Connect, which will automatically alert the emergency services with your exact GPS location in an accident. Despite all of that, this Mark V Corsa wasn't able to achieve a full five-star showing in Euro NCAP safety tests. Poor whiplash protection for rear seat passengers apparently brought the score down to four stars out of five. Nevertheless, NCAP scores of 84 and 86% respectively for adult and child occupant protection are well up to the class standard. More usual safety inclusions that of course feature here include ISOFIX child seat fastenings on the outer rear seats, a tyre pressure monitoring system, hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions and twin front, side and curtain airbags, though unfortunately there's no driver's knee airbag. Plus, of course, there are all the usual electronic assistances for stability and traction control. There's cornering brake control for extra stability through the turns and a drag torque control feature that stops destabilization of the car that would otherwise occur if you were to suddenly lift off the throttle or change down to too low a gear on a slippery road. As we mentioned earlier, you've also got a welcome dose of standard headlamp technology across the range, the extra reach of full LED beams and standard high beam assist that will automatically dip your headlights for you at night. If you want more in terms of safety kit, then you'll need to opt for one of the plusher variants. This GS model adds side blind spot alert, which warns you if you're about to dangerously pull out into the path of an oncoming vehicle. And the top ultimate variant includes extended traffic sign recognition coverage. The Stellantis Group hasn't yet strayed into offering any kind of semi-autonomous driving tech on this class of car. In the way that, say, top versions of the rival Renault Clio do, adaptive cruise control with a lane positioning assistant is the closest that this Corsa gets in that regard, fitted to the top ultimate version. Though all the headlines with this Corsa tend to involve various degrees of electrification, as we've been saying in this review, there's none of that in evidence with the volume combustion variants that most customers actually choose. Still, the light weight of this car's borrowed CMP platform helps it out here, allowing the unelectrified 1.2 litre petrol variants to continue to be very acceptably clean and frugal. With this 100 PS manual model, you can expect to manage up to 55.4 MPG on the combined cycle and return a CO2 reading of up to 114 grams per kilometre, which is still pretty good going for a car in this segment. A bit better than what you get from a comparable Volkswagen Group Super Mini, for instance. The readings fall to 52.3 MPG and 122 grams per kilometre if you choose your Corsa in 130 PS automatic form. The base 1.2 litre 75 PS normally aspirated version 
manages similar readings, 52.3 mpg and 121 grams per kilometer. What about the Corsa Hybrid? Are the efficiency improvements promised by this petrol electric derivative large enough to justify its price premium? Well, the technology sounds quite promising. Incorporating a variable geometry turbocharger, variable valve timing, and a belt-driven starter that combines with the e-motor to start the petrol engine from cold and also restarts the engine quickly and seamlessly while driving. So what's the end result? Well, in 100 PS form, the Corsa Hybrid manages up to 62.8 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 102 grams per kilometer of CO2. In 136 PS, guys, the figures aren't much different, up to 61.4 mpg and up to 104 grams per kilometer. That's good, but to give you some class perspective, a rival and cheaper Renault Clio E-Tech full hybrid does rather better, managing up to 65.7 mpg and up to 96 grams per kilometer of CO2. Still, the Corsa Hybrid does enough to reduce the normal model's BIK tax rating, usually 27 to 29%, depending on variant, down to 25%. But of course, it's nothing like as good a tax return as you get from the Corsa electric model Vauxhall really wants to sell you, which like all EVs is BIK rated at just 2%, at least until 2025 anyway. As we told you in our driving section, the standard 50 kilowatt hour Corsa electric takes you up to 222 miles between charges. For the pricier long range version, that figure rises to 255 miles. All the latest Corsa electric models come as standard with an 11 kilowatt onboard charger, allowing for a 0 to 100% AC three phase charge to be completed in five hours and 15 minutes, or three hours and 20 minutes from 15 to 80%. The same full charge using a more typical seven kilowatt home wall box is estimated to take seven hours and 30 minutes. Supporting 100 kilowatt rapid charging, a typical 0 to 80% DC public charge will take just 30 minutes. At the other extreme, it'd be a yawning 21 hours and 45 minutes from a domestic socket. All the charge times remain the same, regardless of battery choice. What else might you need to know? Well, we'll switch back to the combustion engine models that are our primary focus in this test and tell you that there's the usual stop-start system that cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck at the lights or waiting in traffic. As a Corsa owner, you can also download a useful My Vauxhall app, by which you can take care of your Vauxhall online and book maintenance visits, which, by the way, will be needed every year or 12,000 miles for the petrol engines. There are, of course, plenty of Vauxhall outlets to choose from, so you should never be too far from one. On that subject, at point of purchase, you can get a prepaid Vauxhall Care servicing plan for a relatively small monthly payment over three years. This will cover you for three services and an MOT. Plus, it will give you three years of roadside assistance. Insurance ratings are reasonably comparable with other mainstream brand models in this segment. You're looking at Group 12E for the base 1.2, 75 PS petrol unit, and Group 20D to 23E for the volume 1.2 turbo petrol engine in its conventional forms. The Corsa Electric is rated at between groups 26 to 28E, and residual values on Corsa are better than they used to be. Independent experts reckon that residual values over a typical three year, 36,000 mile ownership period will vary between 36 and 41%, with the electric model at the top end of these projections. To give you some class perspective, that's a bit better than you'd get from a Fiesta, but not quite as good as will be managed by a well-looked-after Renault Clio, which can achieve up to 46% of its value over the same period. Finally, you'll also need to know about warranties. In a class where Hyundai offers a standard five-year warranty, Kia offers a seven-year package, and Toyota offers up to 10 years, it's a little disappointing that Vauxhall, like quite a few other brands, still persists with the usual three-year or 60,000-mile package, which can be extended up to five years and 100,000 miles at extra cost. 
A year's free breakdown cover is also provided along with a six year anti-corrosion guarantee. Vauxhall has produced a much better Corsa of that, there's no doubt. It's smarter, better connected, more sophisticated and even more electrified than any of its predecessors. But it's also considerably more expensive as well. So it's just as well that you're going to get plenty more in return. As we said when we originally tested this Corsa F generation model, we can't help thinking that the determination to produce a full electric version with exactly the same platform and cargo area as the combustion engine variants must have had an impact on the packaging compromises that have restricted rear seat space in this car. And there's unfulfilled dynamic potential here too. Given the impressive super light curb weight, there was the potential for this car to fully rival the class leading handling sharpness that distinguishes some of its rivals, which might have happened had Vauxhall been allowed to tune the dynamic responses of this car for British roads in the way it did with previous generation Corsa models. Despite all this, we can see why this car's proved to be so popular. True, it's not class leading in any particular area, but it's a very mature feeling little thing with combination of virtues that's difficult to beat. It's a small Vauxhall for which no apologies need to be made, especially in this much improved form, which will continue to worry obvious super mini rivals. After all, this model's predecessors had nothing like the depth of engineering and quality of this car, yet still racked up very respectable sales. In this form, the Corsa is aiming to sell on more than just sheer value, and to some extent, it's managing to do just that. It doesn't lead its class in terms of either space efficiency or driving dynamics. And the truth is that for all the electrified headlines here, most sales will still be of the models fitted with either an aging unelectrified 1.2 litre petrol unit or the older version of the Stellantis Group's EV powertrain. But things are changing. And as the introduction of hybrid power here demonstrates, this Corsa is too. Add to that the wide model lineup and the likely deals on offer and you've a super mini that more than ever needs to remain high on any family's shopping list. Music